Perfect. Hello, welcome everybody to the first hybrid afternoon in the science basement since October of 2020. So it's been some time. So we have today our speaker, Lea Urpa. She's a PhD student in the Finnish Institute of Molecular Medicine, a friend of mine and the chairperson of the science basement. So this is the best talk ever. <laughs> so today's talk will cover uh, genetic architecture, how do the genes make us, and on the bottom left of the screen, you will see a QR code. If you uh, take a picture of that code or go to this presimo.helsinki.fi slash afternoon talk, then you can submit questions for the Q&A section after. Of course, if you're here in person, you can ask the questions in person. We will also have a few questions there to get to know our audience a bit better. And I do not have the clicker. So <laughs> one moment. So this is the science basement in addition to this public speaking seminar, we do other projects such as podcasts, blogging science, art and science, and the point is to have early career researchers such as ourselves learn how to communicate our work with everybody else. This is the team that put together today's talk and this ongoing talk series. So um, you will see us on the last Thursday of every month, except next month. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, feelings, thoughts, you may contact us through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, our website, thesciencebasement.org, or then this uh, email right here, afternoons at thesciencebasement.org, uh, to discuss this public speaking seminar specifically. So without further ado, I give the floor to Leah. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to give a talk about my work here today. Um, uh, so let's dive into it. Um, I'm going to talk today about genetic architecture, how genes make us and who we are. Um, but before I start, maybe a little bit about myself. We like to humanize science, uh, scientists. We're not just robots. Um, I am a PhD student in the University of Helsinki, Institute for Molecular Medicine, Finland. Uh, and I'm originally from California. I, I grew up in California and, and uh, moved to Finland in 2014 for a master's and decided to stay for a PhD. Um, especially before I started my PhD, I did a lot of music as one of my big hobbies, a little less time for that these days. Um, and I usually I really enjoy rock climbing also, although it's been a little while since I've been there. <laughs> so, yep. Uh, oops, too far. There we go. Okay. Um, so before I talk about my research in itself, I want to talk a little bit about the history of what would become the field of genetics to sort of put the context around the work that I'm doing today. So I want to focus on a particular period of time between 1901 and 1905, where there was a really big argument about inheritance, meaning how we inherit characteristics from our ancestors and our parents down to us. And in this period, there was a huge argument between two groups of people called the Mendelians uh, and the biometricians. And I'll explain what those names mean later, so don't get too confused by them now. Uh, on the side of the Mendelians, uh, the Mendelians was a guy called William Bateson, and for the side of the biometricians was Sir Francis Galton. So who were these guys, and why was this uh, argument important at all? So their main argument was differences in how and the, the mechanisms of inheritance. So the Mendelians, they believed in this idea of discrete inheritance. So if you have this imaginary example where the mother is blue and the father is red, then you, the, the offspring of these two people would either be blue or red, nothing in between. That means discrete inheritance. These characteristics are given down as one or the other. The biometricians, and again, I'll explain the names a little bit later, uh, believed in this idea of blending inheritance. So if we talk about a mother who is blue and a father who is red, again, in this imaginary example, you could have they, these characteristics would blend together like paint colors, and you would get something in between, in this case, purple, right? So as you might imagine, the Mendelians, there's a very famous person's name in there, and in order to understand why the Mendelians believed in this discrete inheritance, we have to go back to, oops, uh, 1866, where a guy named Gregor Mendel published his work. So who was Gregor Mendel? He was actually born uh, Johann Mendel in what is now the Czech Republic. And um, he, he was renamed Gregor when he enrolled as a, in an order of Augustinian monks. 
And uh, when he enrolled in the order, he first tried his hand at being a parish priest, but <laughs> it turns out he wasn't very good at it because he was so shy. He had a really hard time connecting with the people in his parish. So after a while, he decided that wasn't for him and decided he wanted to become a biology teacher at this school run by the monks. Um, fortunately for science, but unfortunately for Gregor Mendel, he actually failed the exams, not once, but twice, <laughs> to become a biology teacher. <laughs> So after this, he decided to retire back to the, the abbey that he was um, originally enrolled as this Augustinian monk and started doing uh, agricultural experiments in the gardens there. And what he found was uh, basically revolutionary. Uh, he found that he, he took these two uh, strains of pea plants and he called them true breeding because for many generations, let's see if I can get, yeah, for many generations, they would breed either white or purple flowers only. They would only have these ideas, uh, these, these colors of the, plant, of the flowers. So when he crossed these two together, he found that there wasn't some in-between purple or white color. They were only purple flowers. Well, that's interesting, but even more interesting was when he took these offspring from the, the purple and white cross and crossed those guys together, there was a mathematical proportion of three to one purple to white flowers. And this told us a lot of things about the, the underlying, uh, the underlying uh, mechanisms of inheritance, which at this point in time, remember 1866, they had no idea what DNA was. Uh, but the main point we want to see here is that these characteristics were inherited either one or the other, nothing in between. So this was the background between the idea. Uh, so, so Mendel uh, published this work in 1866, but he published it in an extremely small local journal for agricultural research in Brno, where his abbey was, and only in German. Um, and his research was basically ignored for 40 years. He had no acclaim during his lifetime and died in 1844 at the age of 61. So fast forward four year, uh, 40 years, and in the early 1900s, other scientists started actually converging on the same Mendel's ideas, uh, using other experiments and more experiments that showed the same basic principles. <laughs> the thing is, nobody really likes it when you publish something that's supposed to be novel and new, and you're writing your paper, and you go and look for references and figure out Somebody figured this out 40 years ago. <laughs> so a lot of the researchers that actually came to the same conclusions as Mendel kind of ignored his research and didn't cite him and pretended that their research was the first one inventing this, uh, the first one that discovered this. So uh, this guy, William Bateson, did not like that at all. <laughs> he called out all these other researchers because he worked in the same field, uh, repeated the experiments and found the same principles in his own research, and then called out all these other researchers saying, you can't ignore Mendel's work. He did this 40 years ago. So he became known as Mendel's bulldog and a very outspoken uh, proponent of this uh, inheritance model of discrete inheritance. Okay, so that's one side. Let's take a look at the other side now. So who are the biometricians and who is this guy, Sir Francis Galton? So Sir Francis Galton was actually a cousin of Charles Darwin. And he, uh, one of the, he was interested in finding out the mechanisms of inheritance because Charles Darwin, while the origin of species was revolutionary in many aspects, one of the main theoretical holes in the origin of species was it lacked a good model for inheritance which is very important, right? So if you have uh, two species of birds, one, one with a bigger beak and one with a smaller beak, evolution, uh, natural selection, is acting on a bird for, say, for example, favoring the one with the bigger beak. But in order for evolution to happen, natural selection acts on that animal, uh, acts on that population, and then that, that uh, characteristic must be inherited to the next generation. So in, this model of inheritance was extremely important in the model of evolution, but was somewhat lacking in the original origin of species. So in comes Sir Francis Galton, who says, who's probably had something of an uh, uh, academic inferiority complex, having a cousin so famous as Darwin, and said, well, cousin Darwin figured out evolution, cousin Galton is going to figure out this model of inheritance. The problem was, uh, Charles Darwin and Sir Francis Galton, their um, expertise was in observation and categorization. Uh, they weren't very good experimentalists. So Sir, particularly Sir Francis Galton tried to do some experiments to, uh, to, to uh, 
trying to show whether Darwin's original model of inheritance was true or not, but basically abandoned them after some time uh, uh, for the sake of instead doing biometrics. So the word biometrics comes from metric to measure and bio, bio biological characteristics. So he developed a method and to basically uh, uh, observe characteristics of people and then make some statistical observations about them. And one of the most interesting observations that he made was that oftentimes when you look at a natural characteristics, for example, height, this is an example of a living histogram where you have people of different heights all lined up in rows. And what you can see here is that some people are very short, some people are very tall, but most people land somewhere in between. And when you look at the shape that this curve makes, it uh, creates something called a bell-shaped curve, where there's a majority of the individuals are in the center, and some are at the extreme outliers. And he found this when he looked at very many different characteristics, whether that was body mass and many other kinds of uh, observables of people. So this was the underlying basis of the blending inheritance, which makes sense, right? Like, in an, on an intuitive level, when you, when you look particularly at the idea of height, you're never as exactly tall as your mother or exactly tall as your father. On average, most people are about, uh, about uh, half, uh, halfway in between the heights of either of their parents. So, so this is intuitive and it makes sense. So you can imagine how each of the people <laughs> on this end of this argument were absolutely convinced that they were right and the other person was wrong because they had such good evidence to back it up, right? Um, so before we get on to who was right and, and what we know today, it would be remiss not to mention talking about Sir Francis Galton that while he had some very positive contributions to uh, the intel to to, to, to biology and, and science. It was a very complex history. He's also known as the father of eugenics, um, being this, uh, what is known now as non-scientific and pseudoscientific idea of sort of breeding people for the best character, most desirable traits. So very complex history here, and I, it's worth mentioning, uh, or rather it would be bad not to mention this other side of his intellectual contributions. But getting back to the question, which of these guys was right? So in order to answer this question, we'll jump forward in time a little bit to what we know about DNA today and the molecules of inheritance. So this was actually discovered between 1953 and 1966. What we know now is that DNA is the molecule of inheritance and it exists in the nucleus of every cell in our body. This DNA is then translated see if I can get my, yeah, this DNA is then translated um, using a little molecular machine to a temporary copy called RNA. And this copy of RNA is then uh, translated into proteins. Uh, and these proteins uh, are based on the specific template of information in that RNA molecule which comes from the DNA. And proteins make us, uh, whether that's the proteins that make up the neurons that make up our brains, the cardiomyocytes that make up our hearts, the muscle cells that make up our muscles. Every single part of our body is made up of proteins, which are in, and the recipe for those proteins are encoded in DNA molecules. And the majority of DNA is actually the same between every person, like 99.999% of DNA is the same between people. But there are some differences, and those differences can be really important. So one example of this is, uh, let's talk about this little molecule. Uh, so this is a protein, one of those recipes, uh, the thing, recipes from DNA, and called phenylalanine hydroxylase. Now don't get too uh, mixed up by these complicated chemical uh, descriptions. The most important thing is to know is these guys are amino acids. And this protein is called an enzyme. And an enzyme's job is basically to catalyze this chemical reaction. So he comes in here and adds to an oxygen and a hydrogen onto this molecule to turn phenylalanine into tyrosine. Great, that's a thing that happens all the time in our bodies. But sometimes people can inherit a genetic variant that causes this enzyme to not work. And when the enzyme doesn't work, then this chemical reaction doesn't happen. Most of the time, that's not a problem because we inherit two copies of genes, one from our mother and one from our father. 
So this particular gene, which codes for the enzyme here, it, uh, it's fine if you only have one working copy. No problem. It makes enough, uh, does enough of this chemical reaction that you're okay. But if you have two parents that have one copy that works and one copy that doesn't work, you can have a situation where you have a child that inherits both of the broken copies of the gene, which means you have broken copies of the protein, the enzyme. And when this happens, the phenylalanine doesn't get turned out into uh, tyrosine, and you have an accumulation of phenylalanine, this amino acid, in the brain and all other tissues. But the brain in particular, when it's developing, is really sensitive to having too much of this protein in it. And if this happens, it can cause severe intellectual disability and many other health problems for the child. Um, this disease is called phenylketonuria, or easier to remember, PKU. Um, and it's known as a classic Mendelian disease because you either have it or you don't have it. So the Mendelians were right, right? DNA is a discrete molecule, and it's the pieces of DNA are inherited. You either have it or you don't have it. But how does this then explain this continuous variation and the bell curve that we see in so many of these traits like height? Well, there was, in 1918, a scientist called R.A. Fisher reconciled these two ideas. And we'll talk a little bit about how he figured this out. Um, again, kind of need to mention that R.A. Fisher is He's considered the, the father of modern statistics, but today we still use the techniques that R.A. Fisher discovered in the early 1900s. But um, many, let's say, uh, awards and institutions are actually removing his name from this because although he's considered the father of modern statistics, he was also a prominent eugenicist before World War II. But he asked the most important question uh, with regards to this question of continuous versus discrete inheritance, which was, what if more than one gene controlled the trait? So more, no, a lot of the time, genes are represented by A's and B's. But in this example, I'll re represent it by colors. Uh, so you have either red or white, green or white, or blue or white. And those are three different genes. So if you make these into different combinations, three genes times two alleles, or which are names for different copies of the gene variant, then you have 27 unique combinations. So you can imagine that if each of those combinations gave a different phenotype from even just three genes, you would have a huge, already a huge variety of different phenotypes. So let's explain this a little bit with colors, right? So these are all the different combinations that you could have from three different genes. So on the top right here, we've got if you inherit red, green, blue, red, green, blue from your mother and your father, then that resulting color is black. This is just RGB color manipulation. Uh, if you inherited white, 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 then you get white. If you have red and blue, let's see if I can point to it here, red and blue and red and blue, you get magenta, and so on and so forth. So this is sort of trying to illustrate that the different combinations, when you have uh, like combinatorics of many different combinations, it can result in this huge different variety of phenotypes. So, okay, now I need to go here to the... So I'll play a little bit of this video, and then I'll pause it and explain a little bit about what it means. So ironically, even though Galton didn't understand how there, you could have this combination of discrete and continuous inheritance, he invented a device that explains it very well. So this is something called the Galton board. Um, and here, let's play a few seconds, and then I'll explain what's happening. So, whoops. Oh, no. All right, let's try that again. Play just a few seconds, and then we'll pause it. So what's happening here is that you have these uh, metal balls falling from the top of the device. Then they land on pegs. Each time a ball lands on a peg, it has a, uh, two, one of two outcomes can happen. It can bounce left, or it can bounce right. Now, most of the balls, when they fall down, they bounce left about as many times as they bounce right, and they land near the middle of these slots at the bottom. But once in a while, you get a ball that bounces left a bunch more times than it bounces right, or one that bounces right a lot more times than it bounces left. Now, that can happen, but it's not as common. So uh, you'll have less of these balls falling in the corner. Now, let's see what happens if we let all of the balls fall and what kind of formation this uh, results in. <laughs> 
So as you can see, the balls are falling down and they start to make, lo and behold, our bell-shaped curve. So this is a really great example of how many, many, many of these uh, discrete choices, left, right, up, down, can result in a continuous range of phenotypes that create this bell-shaped curve. Okay. So what does this have to do with my thesis work? <laughs> so this was all theoretically discovered, this, this idea of having uh, um, many discrete d choices that can result in continuous distributions all the way back in 1918. But in 2000, we dis uh, had a complete sequencing of the human genome. And following this, a huge increase in technology that allows us to get uh, uh, complete uh, a lot of sequ DNA sequencing information from hundreds of thousands of individuals. And that lets us ask a really interesting question. Can we then look at, let's say we have DNA from everybody in this living, living histogram. Can we then look and say, are there genetic variants that are more associated with being shorter or being taller? And that's something that we've been able to do. So. I apologize for the somewhat potato quality of, of this one, but I couldn't find it, couldn't find it at any higher quality. Um, but this is what we call the results of a genome-wide association study. So this is the only graph I have in the presentation, and I'll walk you through it. So on the x-axis here, we have the positions along, the chrom uh, along your chromosome here. So this part here is chromosome one. So imagine if you took your chromosome one and stretched it out into a string and then laid it there on the plot. That's from the first part of the chromosome, position one, all the way to the end. So these are just genomic positions for each of the chromosomes all the way down to chromosome 22 at the end. And on the y-axis here, is a measure of the statistical significance. So is that genetic position associated with being shorter or taller in this case? And this was a genome-wide association study of 600,000 people published in 2014. So we call this kind of plot a Manhattan plot because in the ideal case, it looks like the skyline of Manhattan. You see many different skyscrapers um, with, uh, with uh, like a uh, Manhattan-ish skyline. And as you can see, there's a lot of skyscrapers in this plot. What this shows is that it's not one or two genes or even three that are associated with being taller or shorter. There are thousands of locations along the genome of different genetic variants that are associated with height being taller or shorter. So this shows basically, uh, we can go back to the idea of the Galton board, right? So you could imagine that each of these pegs here, where the ball falls to the left or falls to the right, is one of these genetic variants. Most people have as many genetic variants that make them tall as make them short, and they land in the middle of the distribution. But some people, like pro basketball players, have a lot of variants that happen to make them taller. And some people have a lot of variants that happen to make them shorter. So why is this important? And bringing it back to my PhD. So one of the things that we can find out is not just an interesting collection of, ah, very interesting that these variants are associated with higher height or lower height, but what it can actually tell us in different disorders is more about the underlying biology of the disease. So for example, um, my main interests are in developmental disorders and uh, psychiatric disorders like bipolar, depression, uh, schizophrenia. These kinds of disorders don't really have very good uh, treatments. And one of the reasons that they don't have very good treatments is because we don't really understand what's going on in the brain and the body of these disorders. So by doing these genome-wide association studies, we can find genetic variants that are associated with the disorder. And then we can say, what is this genetic variant doing? What gene is it in? What protein does it affect? Can we then find out more about the disorder and use that to make better treatments for patients? So who was right in the end <laughs> between the debate between these two guys? Well, they were both kind of right and both kind of wrong. So. Uh, we could say in the end that for most aspects of people, many, many discrete inherited variants combine to create a continuous range of characteristics. Um, so <laughs> that's the moral of the story. This is my main takeaway. But, you know, I'm a geneticist, <laughs> and when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But it's not the whole story, right? So just to throw a monkey wrench in the works here at the end, you can't forget the environment. Both of the examples that I've given today of this more continuous phenotypes like height, as well as the disease, PKU, both have a huge environmental component. So 
We know, of course, that if someone has malnutrition when they're younger, they don't get enough nutrients. They're not going to grow as tall as their maybe genetic potential would be. Um, even the disease PKU. Uh, one of the most interesting... So since it's a disorder of the accumulation of phenylalanine in tissues in, in, when in developing children, one of the easiest things in order to prevent the damage is to give them a diet that's low in phenylalanine, which happens to be an extremely low protein diet. So if you do this, you can actually avoid intellectual disability and most of the problems that are associated with the genetic disorder. Um, in fact, uh, in the United States and in Finland, uh, for decades, every child that's born is tested for this genetic disorder because it's so easy to avoid the problems if you just know and give the child the right diet. So after throwing that monkey wrench in the works, then I would like to thank everybody. I know I'm a little over time, sorry. Um, I'd like to thank my supervisors, uh, Arna Pelotti and Mark Daly, as well as my institute um, and the science basement. And I'd like to mention that the PowerPoint slides were designed with canva.org, figures were created with biorender.com, and uh, the Galton board slow motion video was from Fred Pang. Um, thank you for making your video creative content. And if you're interested in this, um, you can find a lot of the historical information I got from this book called The Gene by Siddhartha Mukherjee. Um, there's also a, cop a translation available in Finnish. I would highly recommend checking it out if you're interested in this topic. So uh, yeah, without further ado, that is everything. Happy to take questions.